Today's presentation is entitled On Lockdown Requirements Change Management. We have our speaker, Hans Ekman. Hans Ekman provides transitional consulting and management for rapidly changing companies. With 17 of his over 20 years of experience creating workflow optimization solutions across diverse industries. He is currently the Technology Workstream Manager at SunTrust and provides process improvement mentoring through the Business Analyst Center of Excellence. He co-founded. Hans is a frequent speaker and mentor with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree um, from the University of Georgia. Welcome, Hans. Thank you. I'll wait till afterwards and make sure that I earn <laughs> Well, fantastic. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about requirements change management. But let's go ahead and start with some ground rules, uh, kind of set expectations. So the first thing, whoops, let me back up one. So as with our wonderful directional challenges, um, speaker, hey, if anyone's live tweeting, there's the hashtag again. It's on the bottom back of the last page if you forget it. Um, and my Twitter handle, although I'm not an active tweeter, um, is at Hans Ekman, which is also my website if you need more information. So, some ground rules. First, this session is for you. You're here because hopefully you saw something that you were curious about, you wanted to learn about. I know this information, so me just talking about it, not as much fun. So, this needs to be an active participation. So, as we're going through this, interrupt me for clarification. There's definitely parts of this that we're going to open up for discussion. I am going to steal some volunteers for a quick part of this. Um, so thank you for volunteering in advance. And if you have those, everyone's got them. Well, in my company, we have this, this, and this, and Bob doesn't play fairly. Let's save those for the end. That way we make sure we get through all the content, all the core issues, and then we can talk about more specialized situations. Um, second there is the disclaimer. This content is 100% mine. Everything I say is mine. Um, the opinions are mine and do not necessarily reflect the opinions uh, or positioning of SunTrust Bank. Although, if you are in the Southeast region, please consider us for all of your financial needs. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll help you light your way to financial well-being. Awesome. Absolutely. No animals were harmed during the creation of this presentation, but please support your rescue groups. So one of the things that ends up happening in presentations is you start with that build-up. Why are we here? What is it we're hoping to learn? And then you end up going through the scenarios and the situations, and at the end, you get the conclusions. Well, why don't we start with the conclusions so you know what to expect, and then you'll see how it fits together. So really, there's three key areas that you're going to see here today. And it's kind of a triangle to successful change management. One is the need for constant digital, uh, excuse me, diligence. So if you are Harry Potter fans, then we'll go to Mad Eye Moody, who says... Constant vigilance, always. The other is triage. How do you handle the things that are coming? How do you handle those changes? What do you do? And what is the threat level? There's tons and tons of changes. Which are the ones that really matter? So as you're going through this, um, all of this presentation is available through the BA, uh, Business Analyst World um, website for download. It's also available on my down, uh, site. So feel free to take the notes that feed into the slides rather than copy them because you will have a full, unfiltered deck. So really, it comes down to three conclusions for you. One is, if you take the principles of release management, change management, and apply those to requirements management, you will be more successful. The next, the level of control must match not only the risk of the change, but also the timing of the change. And then again, Consistency and diligence are your friends. They are required for success. So let me stop. Questions about the conclusions before we get into the justification that says those might be right? Okay? Excellent. So let's talk about the ideal project because I know the reason that everyone is here is because you are participating in perfect projects every single time and there's no problems. So at the beginning of these awesome projects, all your stakeholders are agreeing. They know exactly what they need. You're able to take, they're able to capture that information, and the developers and everyone involved implements it perfectly with no mistakes. There's no defects. There's no missed requirements, and there's really no change in your business or business prioritization during that entire time. 
So by show of hands, everybody here is now living life in those perfectly ideal unicorn-driven projects. Just you. Okay, so we're, we're a little, little further off than that. Okay, well that means there's an opportunity. So why do we care about change? What does it really matter? So I pulled some research, and there's two pretty famous studies that are kind of the benchmarks that are used now, although new ones are coming about. One of them is by Cassie, and it was about iterative projects, iterative development. Um, the next one was Bohm, and he wrote uh, and studied mainly waterfall-based projects. So let's just take a project and say, during requirements and design, for every piece of functionality, for every spec that you write, if it costs you one dollar, only one dollar, to, to record and capture the requirements and design, how much does it cost throughout the life cycle if you weren't perfectly correct? So in an iterative environment, that change when you get to code and unit testing is now going to cost you five dollars to fix. If you're doing waterfall, a little better only costs you three dollars. Well, when you, what happens if it gets through unit testing and you start your integration testing? It will now cost you $10 to fix that during integration testing and run it back through. It'll cost you $7 in waterfall. What if you get all the way to client acceptance testing or user acceptance testing? That defect now costs you $15 to fix if you were following an iterative methodology. $50 in waterfall. How many people are in a waterfall or primarily waterfall? Uh, round half. How many people are agile? How many people are in Process Bob created by their company and it doesn't seem to fit in? <laughs> Process Bob can get us all. So what happens when we do that ever famous, let's let our customers find our defects for us? $30 in an iterative environment, $100. So, $10,000 feature function that you've now put in, if you find defects in that, it could cost you $1 million to fix? Is that right? My math right? Yes. Pretty scary. You really, you, you, you've got to catch things. One of, uh, there's an excellent article in Wired Magazine about the secret of Pixar's success. And their whole delivery methodology is based on failing as fast and as harshly as possible. They shoot down everything they can you know, don't want to contradict our speaker, but what they do is they challenge and they look for opportunities to improve as early as possible. So, um, if you're talking about small, non-critical projects, those little one-off things you have, realistically, you're looking at a five-to-one end-to-end, so the smaller the scale, the, the less it costs, the more opportunities. We saved you a seat right up front. Come on down. Um, current software, uh, so current software projects. Think about all the effort you're putting in, all the hard level work you've done, all the weekends and nights and the extra effort that the team's put in. 40 to 50% of that time is absolutely wasted. Lost to defects, lost to changes, lost to changes. Which means you could be producing almost twice as much work every year at no cost increase if you were able to get control. Now, there's no perfect world. We're never going to get perfect control but we can at least start chipping away. Um, and one of the quotes from these studies was, the two major sources of avoidable read work were hasty specifications and um, nominal case design and development. So basically, trying to rush through requirements and design, trying to say, well, let's just get something on paper and go with it, you're actually pushing and forcing more effort, uh, more defects into the higher cost range. It's kind of like waiting, sitting back, ready to go to work. You decide to wait an extra half hour so that you can get caught in the worst rush hour traffic. And you're making that choice over and over again. So let's look at the reality. And I broke this down into just your most basic SDLC phases. When we define, which includes uh, both requirements and design, when we build it, when we test it, and when we actually go to implement. So really, we know that we're going to get change at all types, but there's different types of change. First, throughout almost the entire life cycle, we are going to struggle against ambiguities, the need for clarifications, or invalid requirements. And that's not placing blame. That's not saying that you didn't believe you were right at the time. 
It just means that it didn't end up being what you needed to get the right solution. Missed requirements. So after you've completed requirements in design, now you start finding all those things you missed. Scope and prioritization changes. The longer the project, the more chance there is that somebody's going to want one feature over another, or one project over another. That's going to impact you. Constraints. You're going to run into design constraints. Resource, time, budget. Projects get hit with budget cuts. A resource leaves the team or changes. Um, the system just can't do the function that you wanted the way you wanted it to. And you don't discover that until you start getting in development, if you're lucky, testing and implementation, if you're really unlucky. Missed implementation. There's something that you needed to do, and it was just skipped. You might have had the requirements. It might have been in the design. It might have been assumed. You thought that, well, the base product's supposed to do that. And no one made sure that it did. And then the last is really where we have almost no control, which is the change in business need. And that usually hits us anywhere until you get halfway through testing, you might be able to start accommodating. When you're about to, t you're finalizing testing and about to go live, then the question is, do you stop and go back and start over, partially start over, or do you move forward and catch up later? Okay. And anytime I breathe, that's also the chance to jump in. So I'm going to really work with everyone here on a prioritization triangle. There's actually two. And the first one is talking about threat levels. So the first thing we need to know is how threatening is that change? So the first one I call no material impact. And what this means is, yes, it's a change. It's something that may need to be corrected or fixed, but it's not a material. It is not a significant change to what people expected to receive at the end. So this is the difference between how you're doing something and what you have at the end. So this is things like fixing typos and formatting, clarifying or further decomposing requirements, where you're adding clarity, you're helping with the message, but at the end of the day, everyone still generally agrees to what it is, maybe not how. Then you get into when you now start having a material impact. If you, when you miss requirements, things that you didn't need to know that you would have to do, finding new requirements, system constraints, business constraints, external impacts, these things are now changing what people expected to receive at the end. So now you have a material impact to the project, and now you've got to decide, do you absorb it? How do you deal with that change? And the last is a governance impact which means that that material impact was so significant that it is affecting your scope, schedule, or budget. And it is outside of your accepted project variances for whatever methodology you're following, whatever your governance is, you, you've now had a change that's gonna push outside that norm and now it has to go through whatever your governance review is. So what I wanna talk about is, because especially in material impact, <coughs> It seems, how many people think that that really aren't comfortable right now? It says that kind of goes against the battle. Anyone? Most people should feel a little uncomfortable because you're talking about, well, wait a minute. You're saying there's no material impact, but if I'm managing requirements, that's part of my business analyst duties. You know, I, I can't have ambiguities. That's one of the ambiguities, smart requirements. These are the foundations of the work we do. So how is it that these things aren't significant? It's not that they're not significant. It's the difference between managing a requirement or a package of requirements and managing the changes to the requirements. In that case, it's the delta. Russ. So, so I think, I, I think Hansi has a good point there. I, what I, I liken that to is, in my world, is I, I define a requirement and I know, what the, I know what the significance of the scope is around that requirement, but I have the opportunity to smooth wrinkles maybe from a functionality perspective. You know, again, I, I always use the, the analogy of, of the house. You know, I have, I'm building a two-bedroom, two-bathroom house, but my, you know, I might define specifically what closet size are, but I'm not changing the scope. Okay, absolutely. And to help illustrate this, I need 
three volunteers for a very, very short and hilariously fun exercise. Got one. Thank you. Two. One more. Three. Thank you. Come on up. So we're in a little odd room, but we'll do this, and I'm sorry, but your backs will be to the audience. So I need, there's three roles here. I need a builder. I need a, the requirements person. And then I need the conduit between them. Okay, builder, down on that. Okay. Can I do it in the middle? Here. Okay. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you, as if these were dominoes, just take the business cards, and I want you to just visually spell out the word dog. You are going to, one by one, hand the cards through the conduit so that he can build the word dog visually on the table. Table. That's what we're here to do. We are here to create the word dog out of business cards. What I want you to do is to count the number of cards after he has everything he needs for dog. So that's our baseline. The cards for building dog are free. Everything after that is a change. Okay? Am I supposed to figure out how many cards he's going to need? Oh, he just keeps asking for cards. You just keep giving them to him until he, until he has it set. Well, this is nice. Did I put those in one? Yeah, do whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be fancy. This is more illustrative than artistic. I just care about how many things. Don't worry, you don't have to start counting yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we've got we know what our we know what our end state is, the word dog made business cards. We have our materials. We could keep time and see, make sure that we're staying on schedule here. And now I'm the evil stakeholder, and I I don't ever recall saying dog. I really thought I said frog. So you need to now change that to the word frog. Now, any parts you ask for, I need to count. Yes. If I need to change it to frog? Yes, change that to frog. I need more cards. Okay, then she'll give you as many cards as you need. We have unlimited budget, just like all of our IT departments. <laughs> okay, so now he's taken the D, and he's transforming the work done there into an R. Whether or not 
your rating system, whether or not your evaluation, whether or not your scale is correct. Aren't you doing it just to get out of work? Aren't you just being difficult? I mean, who wants that label as a VA? We're the facilitators. You tell us what you want, and we just go do it. Yes? Yeah, Hans, I, I like this a lot, and what it, it reminds me is that sometimes we're so into the details, and we're so focused on the little things that a little change seems like a big deal, yes. and that you periodically have to totally pull yourself out and say, wait a minute, looking at the big scheme of things, is this one of those material, or is this just, it looks big right now, because that's where I've been focusing, and that's hard. Right, and we're perfectionists. Yes. You know, it's not only the content that we're worried about, but it's the presentation of the content. It is the structuring, and do I have all my use cases mapped to my process flow documents, and have those mapped to the data flow diagrams. And you're all excited about this, and then something comes in and changes, and your perfect little OCD world starts to crumble apart. <laughs> I, I mean, it's almost like for BAs, when you're hiring, you should screen for OCD, and if they're high enough on the chart, you're like, perfect. That's what I mean. <laughs> So, are there, what, what are some pitfalls of, of trying to classify requirements? What are some problems where you could see automatically, this is going to be hard to adopt into your daily life? Absolutely. So there's, there's two great things you brought up. One of, one, one of them is definitely people get fixated on words and presentations, so keeping them content, uh, focused on the message definitely is the most important part, or else, you know, everybody's a great editor, but not many people want to take the time to write. The other is if you walked forward and said, yes, I understand your change, and it has no material impact to the work I'm doing, so it's not important. It's not relevant, it's not good. So these are words for us to use behind the scenes. I would not put this in front of your stakeholders, in front of your project teams. Um, you can call them green defects, or green changes, yellow changes, and red changes. You can give them names. It can be Bob, Shirley, and Tom. Whatever you want to do, make it benign, make it fit in, make it fun, so that people aren't threatened by labels. They aren't threatened by thinking that their change is diminished. This is a way of prioritizing the changes, which breaks into the next part. It doesn't do me any good to break out the different impacts of a change <coughs> if I don't take the time to find out how am I going to deal with them. So if it's not a material impact, really we're talking about recording and communicating. So the fact that we had 10 business cards that were supplemental we had eight business cards that had to be reworked to fit into the solution. Do you, you know, does that, where, does that really need to be published in the core of your requirements? Is a developer or a tester really going to worry about what that change was? Not so much, but you have to have some sort of a tracking log, some place to keep a record of. Now, if you're doing this manually, we'll take a look at, uh, I'll talk to this at the end, about ways of tracking this. But if you're, you, you can do it manually, you can do it within your documentation. If you're using a system, um, this, a lot of the systems will track this for you. Um, any defect management, open soft, uh, software, can be used for the same thing. You can have priority tickets for changing and having, have people log defects against your requirements document. And I'll touch a little more on that as well. So if it's a material impact, it, the big decision there is, is this enough of a change in expectations, in constraints, that somebody now needs to approve this? I don't get to just make that decision. The project manager, no matter how lofty and empowered they are, should not be making this decision. Somebody owns that decision. Somebody is saying, this change is going to cost this impact. I am going to purchase 10 more business cards for you so that we can have a frog instead of a dog because they are fetch better. When you get into governance change controls, this is really where it falls down to your organization and your methodology. The only difference between yellow and red is one of them goes through whatever your formal process is. So in a way, if you don't have a formal governance process for changes, you can just make a more extreme change or a wider distribution. But whoever owns 
the piece, whether it's the SME, whether it's the business lead, business owner, is the one who has to make that decision and approve, and they can only do that if they know what the impact of the change is. So what are some ways you think you could adopt triage levels or, or ways of handling this uh, as part of your requirements management process? Libby? I've actually already adopted this in our work stream at SunTrust. Thank you. But the hardest thing for me to explain is the difference between where we've got the required project change control versus the governance change control. Yep. And the way we've defined it is, if there is cost or schedule changes, it goes through governance. Yep. And anything else is either material or not material. Yep. Who's ever heard of a death by a thousand cuts? That's really what we're fighting against. Any one of these changes, any small change, like the big ones, nobody argues. Everyone knows how to deal with those. If we change, significantly change what we're going to have at the end, everyone knows there's an impact. But, well, let's switch it so that the screen flows in the reverse order instead. Those little changes add up quickly and fast, and it takes away that 40 to 80% buffer that PMs build into every project, or that you built into your requirements approach. So you really have to, that's why you've got to get close control and, and have that diligence throughout the process. So, if there's no material impact, what is it you need to do? And when do you need to start? So, if you're just starting your requirements gathering, your requirements approach, you are in the process, you're reviewing draft documents, you're going through and trying to create whatever that first package or first deliverable is, this really doesn't enter in. All you are dealing with is change and discovery and new stuff. So you really don't even have to worry about it. Change doesn't come in until you have that first deliverable where the team has an expectation that that's what they need to produce. Once the team has an expectation, once they have a belief of what's going to be done based on something you produce, from that point forward, you now have to manage their expectations, manage their changes. And you could have different parts of a project in different phases. On a second wave, you may be just in discovery. You don't really need to manage changes there because everything, again, is a change. You have to update the system of record for requirements. So when you see these changes, when you decompose requirements further, where you remove ambiguities, you need to have that in whatever, whether it's a Word document, whether it's a system, whether it's uh, you know a uh, Kanban board with Post-it notes, whatever your method is, you really need to uh, get that updated. You also make sure to log all changes with an effective date. Just like when you're fighting with customer service and you log every person that you talk to, what they said and what the time was, so that when you finally get to that supervisor who can actually give you what you want, you can say, here's the 22 people I talked to and what they said and why you need to fix this. Yes? Do you have a good tool for log for tracking your Um, Yes. And part of the downloads is all of the templates that I commonly use for these different levels are available for download, both on the conference site and on my website. And those are the manual way. Those can be easily converted to lists and SharePoint or any other tool. Any defect tracking tool um, works great for this. Um, a lot of BAs have this pride and, and this fear of logging defects against requirements. Um, I'll talk about this in a little more detail, but I actually engage testers and developers as early as I can in the requirements and have them going through and look, asking for clarifications because it's improving the quality of the work I would deliver. Um, so not only do you need to log everything so you have a record of what was decided when uh, for accountability, for changes, for knowing the impact when something goes off the rails, um, but you also really need to make uh, sure you have a, excuse me, that the update process um, is the foundation for the change approval. So you have to have a way, a systematic way of doing, of going about these changes, about logging them, about reviewing them, so that people have awareness. That way it doesn't catch anyone by surprise. This is a cycle that continues to go around and around. You'll do this in every change you may have to revisit changes. It is cumbersome, it is time consuming, 
but it saves you in the end. Um, so one way, uh, there's a couple of easy ways of documenting changes. If you want to just look at the most basic, add a change table to the, head, the, to the beginning or to the appendix of your requirements documentation. It can be a simple table that says what version was modified, who modified, and then what I like to do is a short description of what the change is. I have the before requirement, I have the after requirement, and the date it was effective. There's your before after tracking, you've got everything you need. On small projects, this could be a page, a couple pages. Um, unfortunately, my record, I think, was 38 pages of, change, uh, of changes for one particular project. I wish I had moved it to a system earlier. Um, you really want to also identify the owner or the source anytime you can. Because if not, it looks like you made the change on your own. So if you can have a, it came out of a status meeting, uh, review with a SME, who the source of record is, then shifts the responsibility for that change on them. Because we're stewards of business need, we aren't the ones who are generating business needs, and we never want to be just the order takers. Um, and then again, the before and after really will help people. So what happens when you need approval? Well, this is additive. So everything we were just doing before, now we have one more step on, on top of it. <coughs> which we're going to leverage that update. However, I'm updating the requirements, whatever that process and cycle is, I'm now going to add a step that states the change, the impact, and the impact also needs to include cost, schedule, anything else that it hits. Even if it's that can be absorbed, you need to indicate what the change is so people don't think it's a free lunch. And then find a way of getting stakeholder approval. It can be system-based, it can be email, it can be logged as approved in status meeting on this date um, or in your meeting notes, whatever you have, just so you have some record of when that change was made. Because is there anyone who's gotten to the end of the project, a stakeholder or somebody looked at something the system did and said, when did that change? I don't remember asking for blue buttons instead of green buttons. And you need a place to be able to go back and say, well, the UX design team came up with that and you approved it in this stakeholder meeting on this day. If you want to change it, here's the cost. So there's lots of ways of tracking approvals. One is I could have a spreadsheet. I could have something like a SharePoint list or something that has, in this case, um, I had a change control ID. And this is for formal approvals. Um, for this particular project where this was derived and I had to put this in place, we were completely redesigning. We were upgrading the entire infrastructure based software operating tools for a very large client-facing system. At the same time, we decided to enhance it. And by the way, there was no baseline documentation that told anybody what the system did today. We just said, well, somebody knows somewhere. While we were going to implement and replace with a new system, there's production fixes, there's minor enhancements going on to the current system. We had to evaluate, do we put them in the new system? Do we allow you to put them in the old system? Because we had to manage that disparity. So in this project, we actually had close to 90 official governance change controls affecting what functionality, which changes got in or out of the project. So we had a unique change control. <coughs> it was mapped to a one-page assessment document we were using, data identified, what the change is, the reason, the status, and these you can pull from drop-down fields so that everyone's got the same thing. An hour effort is how we were managing, who the contact for the change is, and some of these fields I've blanked for to protect the guilty. Target release, revised target release, when it was approved, uh, when development is targeted to be complete, when it actually was complete, and so on and so on. So actually, this managed to find out that every change, every requirement, every functionality or grouping here, where some of these were bundles of changes, I could tell you when the decision was made, when the design was complete, when development was complete, and when it was going to be implemented. And that way we could track that along with the project schedule. Is that a PM's job? If you're talking about the release schedule and the sequencing of events, yes, that scheduling is part of the PM's responsibility. But you're managing the requirements. You're ensuring as the advocate and spokesperson for the business need 
when that change is getting implemented so that they can track against it. So absolutely, I feel it's the VA that owns that. Um, as you go forward, it also can, uh, let's see. Um, you can simplify. So in this case, we had uh, what the change was for clarifications, what the new and updated requirements, and then what the justification was. So one of them is a tracking sheet or your dashboard for managing it. The second tab was the actual details. What am I changing? Why am I changing it? Now, you can then cut and paste this into your system of record. You can just reference it as a included document that's considered part of the package. Whatever works for you. Maybe a Word doc will work better. Maybe a system will work better. It really, you've got flexibility. And when you get to this level, when you're really managing critical changes and governance changes, it's always great to create some little template, some form, for people to request the change. What is it what you want to do? What's the business justification? Because people ask for stuff until they have to justify why the difference between a red or a blue button drives business value and client adoption or retention rates. You know, it makes their life harder. It will get rid of a lot of the noise and make it harder for people to justify their changes when their changes are based on unsupported opinions. <coughs> Excuse me. At some point, you probably have a, a formal governance change control form. It may be part of your PMO. The PM will normally submit it, but as we know, the VAs are do all the writing for the PM. So chances are you're going to be filling in the details, or you're going to want to to make sure the right deals, details get filled out. Um, you can, I would advise creating a form, keeping it as simple as possible, but capturing the details you want if you're creating one on your own. If not, try and map what you're capturing for normal changes so that it maps as closely as possible to the governance form so that when those material changes that weren't governance impact have stacked up so much that it's now a governance impact, you now can easily translate. Um, also, don't ever be afraid. Don't feel constrained by the tools you create. You, just like you create the requirements package, there's nothing in the BABA that says, I must write narrative requirements in a tree format and with use cases and user, uh, excuse me, mock-ups as references to them. They say, come up with the best package that works. If it's sticky notes on a wall, that works for you. Same thing here. What you really want to do is create something that enables how you want to manage, something that fits into your skill set, <laughs> something that fits with the team. Um, a few places where this falls in, and, and also in a governance track. There's a certain point typically where your requirements package or a piece of it is approved. I like to go back and have it approved at the very end of the project. And I have often jokingly said, and few people have realized that I wasn't joking, but serious. If you want me to build an accurate requirements package, let me write it after the system is in production. And I can tell you exactly what the thing's going to do. Before then, it's going to be wrong. Inevitably. Something's not going to be the same. So, um, sorry, I lost the um, <laughs> I'll edit that part. Um, so I'm just going to, I think I hit the key. Oh, sorry, approvals. So I approve at the very end of each phase. At the end of the phase, that basically says, after everything, incorporating all these changes that you independently approve, I agree that this is the representation of what it is we're implementing. So it's really a soft approval saying, hey, we're drawing a line in the sand saying this is now the official record. You can also add into that because some governance processes say if you approve a requirements document, you have to reapprove the design. All you have to do on that is say that all changes represented here are already incorporated into the approved designs during the course of the project. And that usually meets most governance requirements. Um, and then that way at the end, you do have something that matches. You don't have you know, something that's strung together. So there's a few best practices um, that I want to recommend. One, the first one touched on briefly. You've got to communicate. You've got to set this up from the very beginning. Even if you have downtime during a project where you, this doesn't apply, start building it for your next one. Reuse it, improve, modify, create those reusable assets that you can drive. Give them to other people. Get their ideas. Have them help improve. There's a lot of people that will participate. 
Um, it takes away a lot of the surprises. You really don't want to shock somebody by saying, okay, now that you've approved the requirements package, here's the process you're going to have to go through if you're going to change anything to my perfect document. <laughs> Not so much. So if they know up front, you'll get a lot better acceptance. If you get pushback, you own the requirements process. The BA owns that. You drive that. That's where you need to butt heads with the PM and say, listen, back off. This is my ownership. I am responsible for these deliverables. Um, and, and build that consensus and support from the very beginning because when things start to fall apart, the PM is going to be so thankful that you put this work in. Maintain consistent control and communication. This is the hardest thing ever. A lot of us finally have gotten in the habit that every time you get into the car, even if you're backing up from one parking space to another, you automatically put your seatbelt on. This has to be as mechanical because when you get busy, when you're hit, trying to hit a crunch deadline and you start skipping, you stop tracking some of the changes, you are now behind, you will not catch up, it is going to be very difficult to get back in strong. So even though this is perceived overhead, it is critical overhead to successful requirements management. This is the tool, this is the way requirements management becomes possible and effective. Um, you've got to know what the impact is. Uh, and, and really, I can't stress that enough. Pull together okay, your team leads, your testing team leads, your dev team leads, your SMEs. Have them create a mini panel to evaluate the change requests. Have a schedule. I've built out schedules where it says every Tuesday we take cha the changes. We have two days to do an impact assessment. We'll review them on the fourth day. Whatever gets approved is part of the next week's actual requirements and design changes. So build that consensus, build that team, and it also helps spread so that it's not like you're making the decision or that you're picking who to go to for that approval. You've got something in place. Um, tools are our friends. Anything that makes it easier or automated, um, definitely use. A requirements management system, when properly used, is wonderful. But you need to understand how it works. You need to come up with a method of using it. Um, come up with your defect or change logs, something to track, something to take notes. Even if you're just taking small notes and maybe not going through the full rigor, something you can fall back on and start building the habit. Um, at the very least, turn on track changes in work. And at, periodically, when you hit a certain milestone or approval, wipe it, create, save one red line version, save one clean version, and change from there. So your document version can do that. A minor revision to a document can just keep numbering on and on, and you reset. These 42 changes were made to 1.03, slicing a new one, next set of changes are version 1.04. The other reason that that helps is, think about your developers, especially if you're using offshore development distributed teams. If you have an eight-page requirements document that you produced, and it's beautiful and it's bound and it has all seven tabs, it's wonderful. But am I really going to go through and reread it every time you publish out a new minor version? Or am I going to look through the changes? And if I keep looking through the changes and I'm seeing the same things I've read over and over again, I gloss over. It's hard enough to get people to read and look at what we're doing anyway, so focus them in on what's different because they can handle the delta. If they understood the core, they can understand the delta very quickly and adapt that. Cross-reference every change as much as possible. Just like we do with traceability in requirements packages, you need traceability in your change management process. The source, the reason, the date, any supporting documentation, wherever it comes from, however it works. Create the, the library of information you need to track and, and keep tracking it as, uh, throughout the process. So how would this work if you're actually fortunate enough to be in an organization that has baseline system documentation? So you already know what the system does today. We're about to launch an upgrade or an enhancement or release. What is it? Well, now we have a whole requirements approach that is based on dealing with that. We know we have the baseline requirements. We now have changes, new functionality. That functionality has impact. When I combine those at the end of the project, I will have a new baseline. So the sum of your baseline and everything you change becomes the new baseline. And then that becomes your baseline and you start it again. 
So what that means is if you started to build that repository of requirements, your project is nothing but the delta in what's changing. It is nothing, your whole project now is nothing but the changes. So let me pause there a second because that one can be a little tricky. So if we were doing, in our card example, dog to frog, what would have been our requirements? If we started with dog, that's the existing system, and we upgraded dog to frog 2.0, what would have been what would have been our requirement our project requirements? What would have been the scope of requirements for our project? Okay. The ten changes, the ten new cards, the ten new additions, and and the rework. The modification of our existing objects, our existing processes, flows, um, would have been the requirements. Doesn't that sound a lot easier to deal with? than to tell us how to build frog from scratch. We're not building frog from scratch. We're changing a dog into a frog. So uh, focusing in on just the part that matters makes it a lot easier and reduces a lot of that wasted effort and time. Um, if you're using a requirement system, this is very easy. If you're doing this manually, I encourage you to break up your package into usable areas. If you think about a larger system that maybe different groups are interacting or using with. What is one of the biggest pushbacks you've heard for not using baseline requirements or not having multiple teams work out of the same set of requirements? Okay. Stepping on each other, um, not good communication between the two different projects. And yep. Dead on. Requirements go in here and not there. And well, if I have two BAs who are updating the same set of requirements, how are we going to know who's right? How are we going to know which requirement gets implemented? How are the two of them going to work it out? Guys, if you have two BAs that are fighting over the same requirements, when do you want to find that out? While you're documenting the changes? Or after you've now put in conflicting upgrades to the same system because those requirements didn't match? The, so that argument is actually the driving factor to pushing towards baseline requirements. The reason you want to do it is the faster you can find two people fighting, the faster you can resolve the conflict. But if you don't know till the end, $100 for a dollar change. So I want to drop back to the conclusions a second and then open it up for more um, scenario discussion or implementation questions. Um, so. When you think about release management, where you've got a structured process of here's the steps we go through, here's the checkpoints before something goes in, those steps are identical for us in requirements management. They're needed by us. The principles are the same. So anytime you're looking at release management, think about how can I incorporate these lessons, these values, into my BA practices. Same thing with change control, change management. PMs have have been the sole guardians of change controls for a long time, but their change controls over the project constraints. Your change controls are over the project requirements, and the BA owns the requirements. So anytime you can look at the practices that are working or not working, modify them and build them as part of your requirements approach, even on a small scale, eventually on an enterprise level. You have to understand the change and the level of control over that change has to be proportional to the risk and when it happens. The higher the risk, the more tight control you need. The later in the project, the more tight control you have. I had a project that had a minor setback in deployment, so they said, well, since we're going to push out two weeks, there's two features we want to go ahead and enable. We can do them in the same timeline, no problem. That list of new features in that two weeks is now at 80. Because they saw an open door, and they said, well, we can get this all done. You know, the vendor said they can all deliver this. We're like, but we don't have enough time to test. And all this is new functionality, and we don't know the impacts. That's where the floodgates open and, and where we've got to do it, uh, where we've got to uh, tighten it down. Consistency and diligence is required at all times. It's the hard, this is where OCD is your friend. 
Everything has to get through the cycle. It's got to be through the same way. You don't want to be a barrier to entry, but you've got to have checkpoints. You've got to have guardrails. Be positive. Be happy. Don't use the word no. Yes, I'd love to incorporate the change. Let's find out what it's going to impact. Let's make sure that it's not taking away a functionality that is more important to you. Um, so in the deck, when you download it, there are links to the studies that I quoted in this um, and other articles that may be helpful. Um, if you run into any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Please feel free to grab my business card and connect on LinkedIn. Um, the presentation is live on my website now, so you can download it and a zip file of all the templates that have all the proprietary information stripped out. They're just guides, they're just examples I went through. One of them is a, called a clarifications template. And I started this when I worked years ago for an offshoring company. And what I found was by the time they got to design, it was too late. So I started incorporating the testers and developers. And every time I had a piece of the requirements ready for review, ready for them to read, not incomplete where they were finding all the gaps I was filling in. I had them go through and start logging clarifications. What document version? What page? What is your question? And that dr dramatically increased the quality of what I was producing. Because when I write something, it's perfect. It makes perfect sense to me. But nobody else has to live with my screwed up mind and doesn't know what it means. And you've got to have other people reading. It doesn't mean you're not doing a great job or a fabulous writer or super organized. What it means is somebody doesn't have, doesn't have your perspective. They don't have your legacy knowledge. You can't take your legacy knowledge away and know what it looks like to someone else. So you've got to have those people looking at, evaluating, and running that through. It's very informal. You can set up daily cycles and go through. And then just set the expectation. If you see something where they've read ahead of the document and they're trying to skip to the end of your choose your own adventure and say, but I don't know how it ends. We don't know how it ends yet. Just wait. Put that on hold. We'll come back to it. Um, but that will really help throughout the process of improving. Um, also, there's a slide uh, about SunTrust Bank. Please feel free to take a look at it. And uh, So let, let me open up. We've got... Um, uh, especially with this session format, some wonderful extra time that normally we don't have. So I want to find out from all of you, you know, what are some, what are some takeaways? What are some changes that you think you might be able to adopt in your daily life or in your future from this session? Yes? Absolutely. And, and again, the timing is important on that. If they, if someone pings you on IM, they expect a response in 15 seconds or less. In email, 30 minutes or less. But if you have a document that's delivered at 4 p.m. and you've committed to deliver them a response by 10 a.m., they back off. They know what to expect. You've already said, here's what I'm going to do. And if you miss a deadline, just tell them. People are understanding. So that absolutely that's great. What are some other ways that we can incorporate? Yes. SharePoint a lot just because it happens to be a tool that we use with any of your content management systems, any of your internal networks, a lot of them can do the same thing. But if you've got a list that you control the fields and field values, and especially if you can set views, you could create a release view of those changes. You could create an impact view. You could include a um, governance, non-governance view. So instead of you driving out and manually pushing that information out over and over again, give people a, a place to look where they know, where they can comment and contribute mm -hmm. to it as well. So absolutely. Yes? Um, the table that tracks the changes with the source information, especially who the, who the doctor of the change was, that impresses me quite a lot. But my question with that regarding that is, do I send out the BRD every time there's a change? 
added to that, a column a row added to that table? Um, if you are manually distributing a requirements document, uh -huh. then sending it out every time is going to drive people insane. Right. They're going to stop looking at it and start reading it. Yes. If you use your change log as the method for what changes, what you're doing is, is you're basically popping up like a little news alert that says, by the way, look at section 14.8.2.3.4.5, it now reads this instead. If that doesn't make sense, you open up your version of that document, go to that section and say, oh, okay, this has changed, now I have the contents. If, this, if the requirements document is in a document library where you're managing out of a requirements management system, then every time you make an update, it's live. So in that case, they can pull it when they need it, but you can communicate through change instead. Like imagine from, if your project manager started every status meeting, by reviewing and talking you through everything that had been done to date. I'm trying to break my PMs of that habit. Every time we have a status review and I say, okay, tell me what the outliers are, what are the critical decisions, what are the variances we need to worry about, whether we've hit them or not. And they start going through, well, last week we completed development and we're entering testing and the testing's going well and we've executed this thing. Why do I need to know any of that? Are you still on target? Yes or no? Is everything still good to go? Then let's move on to the next project because other ones are tanking. Don't need. Thank you. Yep. What are some other things? What are some other things that you might be able to incorporate or change or incorporate into your process? Or Hans, it seems to me that a lot of this information is going to be very beneficial for you when you're estimating your next project. Absolutely. You could create. I mean, at the very least, you can you could create a. Um, uh, a stability variance on your requirements. If you have 10,000 documented requirements and you have change logs accounting for 2,500, you're running a 25% variance. You're going to need to plan ahead for that. Um, so sizing, getting people in the habit. Of, there's two habits that are really important that you're driving, and this is where subversion is your best friend as a BA. One of them is getting people to, to take the time to look into the impact and to estimate. The other is justify why you're making me make this change. What is the business value? What is the cost savings? You're telling me something that's going to cost me money, anywhere from a dollar to a hundred dollars or a hundred times more. Why should I make that? Not just because you're the boss, not just because you're paying for the project. My job as a steward is to make sure that I don't let you drive off a cliff. One, by slowly correcting, you know, I, as a, as a uh, driving instructor, holding that steering wheel every once in a while, jerking it back as you start to veer off the road. So those are two hidden agendas that you're trying to change the way people think, and that absolutely will help you with further projects and estimations. Hans, I think, I think you, um, the concept of, of spotlighting your, your changes in your requirements efforts is, uh, as you mentioned before, oftentimes as business analysts, we're a little fearful of that because it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, I did a bad thing. Whereas the engagement with having that, that early engagement with your development and your testing communities, those, those really are the consumers of your requirements. And so if, if I have that open dialogue with them, spotlighting what specifically the changes are, I think it, it actually minimizes other changes down, down the road. Right. Absolutely. And, and one thing I've noticed that's really hard about this is a lot of times when you go to breakout rooms, you go to a training class, it's tactical. Here is the system. Here's how you're going to use the system. Here's how to write better use cases. Make sure that you use double lines in between here and shading in these boxes and everything. Everyone will read them better. This is more philosophical. This is more foundational and more of approach, which also means it's a lot harder to adopt because it's not like there are distinct steps you can implement. You're changing your behavior, and you're changing the behavior of other people on the project. That's stressful. That's hard. Um, this type of diligence, I'm sad to say, I do in almost every aspect of my professional life. I have every email within our corporate email retention guidelines um, <laughs> ever sent to me. A lot of time, the reason I do I cannot tell you how many times I've been burned by not having it. In the new Outlook, I color code them into categories. I used to put them into folders. 
But I can tell you, I can look and I can find emails very quickly by color coding, by categorizing, by prioritizing, and when something goes wrong, I can pull that message. And I will not tell you how many times I have saved my own skin by being able to apply to a manager or a stakeholder or to an employee and say, actually, I understand the frustration, but here's when this was agreed to, or here's where this was communicated. The email is attached. Um, and it saves me. The other thing is, is it gets people to back off you. It stops micromanagers. If they keep picking away on stuff and you keep hitting them back with more details than they're used to, they will leave you alone. They have the confidence they're not going to get into a battle of wits. And that will save you time and churn as well. What are some, so what are some pitfalls? What are, let's talk a minute because we got some time. What are some pitfalls that could make this go south? Where, where do you see trying to take a change control approach as a tool for requirement management is going to fall short, is going to cause problems? May just not work for you personally. What, what are some thoughts there? Yes? Well, the only issue I'm having is that almost any requirement change that's material is going to impact client budget schedule. And right. so you have to figure out where, where does it become governance versus not. There's got to be some sort of baseline or standard that says you have the 10 or 20 percent flux. If people agree, no, it's not governance or it is. That's, that's where I think. So like a good VA, I'm hearing that you can't have ambiguities in your change process, just like we can't have ambiguities in our requirements either. Absolutely. Define the levels, define the thresholds, um, and, and you may need to revise it, and if you do, publish it, discuss it. Because one of the challenges is, and stakeholders are crafty, they're going to figure out that if something's too big to get in, I can split it into lots of little things over the next week, and I can sneak them all past you. So that's why a periodic review may really help you. So you can take a cumulative review of those changes and say, yeah, each one of these was five minutes, but you gave me so many, it's going to push us a week behind me. And don't be afraid, I mean, don't be afraid to say that. If you stick to the facts, if you can document and back it up, it takes some of the emotion away. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus in on the facts, not the emotion, not the gut reaction of, well, I think the system is too slow. I understand. Okay. What use case were you doing? And what do you cons what was slow? How did you time and measure that? Well, we didn't really time it. We just felt it was too slow. Okay. Well, we agreed that this screen would load in five seconds. It's loading on average in 14.2. What is too slow? Was our NFR, non-functional requirement, for load times too high and we need to revisit it? Or is it our perception? Are we missing a little a swirling bubble or a dancing penguin to keep people occupied and let them know the system's actually working? Maybe. What are some other pitfalls, problems you'd have adopting this? And feel free, I mean, you can say, I'm absolutely crazy and bonkers and this will never work. It's been said before. <laughs> yes? And my only uh, concern is, like, how does this work in agile projects? You know? Like, where do you have business come in and work with the developers and have all this change Approvals. Uh, I, I feel like it might build a wall against okay. uh, the business and the building. Okay, great. So, how would this work in ad?